Okay, everyone, we are now at the top of the Singer 301, and I am going to show you what I'm using. I use this uh, clear synthetic grease, but you can use the regular uh, Singer lubricant. It's also fine. This uh, is a clear colored grease, and it's thicker, but again, when I run out of this, I may just use Singer grease, and I'll just keep one grease in my uh, toolbox. I don't need two, but the main point to talk to you here is make sure that you have a cotton swab that is nice and dense, or you can also use a cheap, um, inexpensive artist brush. Uh, you may have another tool you want to use, but notice, I'm going to zoom in here. I want you to see the gears that I'm lubricating, and again, these, this is a set of uh, metal on metal gears, and I want to zoom in even a little bit more here. And if you look closely, you'll see uh, where I'm putting this daub of grease here, down below is another gear. Don't know if it'll show up here or not. There it is. You can probably see down here. There's the gre there's the gear that this one is rotating against. But I, all I need to do really is to put my grease in my top gear here. So I'm not. I notice I'm just going to kind of. Uh, I'm, what I'm going to do is turn the hand wheel, and I'm just going to dab. Again, just just enough to fit within the teeth of the gears. I don't need to, to drown this gear in grease at all. That's just a waste of grease and a good way to make a mess. And what I'm trying to do is to simply get just a bead. It's, it's not quite the same. If I have the, uh, the syringe from the Singer lubricant, that would probably be a little faster. But notice I'm just dabbing what is essentially as little grease as I need to in this uh, set of gears. And what's happening is as I turn the gear and later as the machine gets tested, what will happen is um, this, the grease that I'm putting on this gear is going to, of course, come in contact with the lower gear. So I don't need to reach down and put grease on that gear down there. It's getting on there now as I turn this. And you can see I've even got a little excess. I don't even need that. Right? Even with the small amount of grease I put on here, I didn't even need that much. And you can see some of the old grease is uh, coming off, it's pushing out some of the old stuff there. So that's, that's essentially it. That is the, the gear. I remember we've already greased the um, hand wheel and the worm gear of the motor with the Singer lubricant. That's what went on the, uh, on the hand wheel gear. And of course, it is now spread onto the motor gear. So. If you have two gears that, that um, uh, run together, you just get grease on one of them and it should apply it to both. And that's it. That literally is all I needed to do to grease the upper gear of the drive shaft. And of course, that's basically it as far as greasing those. Now we will save this grease because I'm going to need to grease some very similar gears under the machine. But remember, we're going to start up top and work our way down. Now. Uh, let's talk while we were we, while we are here. We'll talk a bit about uh, the rest of the lubrication for the upper part of the machine. Now, one of the things you will notice is that I want to talk to you about the difference between the places you oil your machine when you're simply maintaining it while you're using it to sew, and when you're doing an overhaul or restoring. One of the great things about machines from 1951. Uh, such as this one, is that of course it has its oiling holes in the top lid. And this little material you see here is not dirt. That's actually, uh, they used to put little wicks in these. I haven't found any replacements for those, but that's okay. Uh, the oiling holes will still function for you. Uh, now, you'll notice that the holes in the top line up with certain oiling points for the drive upper workings of the machine. When you are no doing normal maintenance to your sewing machine and you need to oil it, you don't need to take the lid off. You can simply, on this model, you can simply put oil in all of the oiling holes. And again, it was designed that way. That's one of the beautiful things about these. But for the restorer's point of view, there, I, and I will put oil in these holes eventually when we're done, but I want to go in and show you the difference. So let's suppose you've got the lid on the machine and you've, you know, you're going to oil it and you're getting ready to start a project, what would you do? You would put one drop of oil in each one of the holes. And there's three on the right, and then there's two on the left. One of them is uh, 
for the side mechanicals here. And then we'll talk about the, the presser, uh, presser bar adjustment in, in a little bit when we get to the side. So that's all you need to do for normal oiling. The reason I have the lid off to do the oiling that I need to do is that many times when you're bringing a machine back and it's been asleep for years or decades, uh, the machine can be dry. There may be some residual lubrication in here, but again, normally when the machine has been properly maintained, you only ever want to use one drop at a time because these machines use the oil that you put in them and they don't have a tank. They don't have a storage reservoir any place. And if you put more than one, you start putting two and three drops, you will get um, you'll get a mess. You'll just get oil dripping in places you, you don't need it to be. Now, having said that, you will notice that I'm going to use more oil here. When you're trying to get a machine out of its dormancy and back up into the, in, amongst the living world, you really need, sometimes you will find you need more, okay? So I'm going to find these holes that were lined up, and I'm going to put two or three drops, right? Now that's a lot. You would never do that for normal oiling. But again, I am basically having to put oil in a machine that doesn't really have um, much in the way of, and this is not an oiling point, but I'm going to go ahead and put some there anyway. Again, you know, <clears throat> like the Tin Man, you've got to kind of wake them up. So then when I start moving, oh, that's so buttery smooth now that it's got its new oil. It had a little bit of residual in there, but again, I want to make sure that I draw the distinction. How much oil you see me use as a restoration technique is not uh, what you would use. In my own sewing machines, when, which they have been, of course, overhauled, restored, when I get ready to, to do anything with them, I only ever use one drop, to, and that's the beginning of a project. Um, but for the purpose of restoration, we, need, uh, we often find that we need more than that. Now, what I'm going to do over here at the presser bar, open that door, since we're above, you can see it. I'm going to clean some of that. That's just some old dust or soiling. Now I'm going to put a couple of drops around the threads of this. This is the adjuster for the presser bar and just put some there. Again, one drop is usually enough and that's not really a normal oiling point even, but again, I am dealing with what is essentially a pretty dry machine. So there you go, guys. You have just seen me overhaul the, uh, the, the, the cleaning, the grease, and the lubrication for the upper part of this machine. Now, one thing to mention to you, when you're going inside, I see a little place over here I want to talk about. <clears throat> this place on the upper right, you can see this is the little compartment where the, the worm gear of that direct drive motor, it, that's where it lives, right there. And of course, it's lined up with the, the textile light gear that you saw me put grease on. Now, sometimes with a machine, you will see stuff this is old grease that kind of splattered onto the machine, and you can see I could pull it off with my uh, cotton swab. Removing this is an option, okay? As long as it doesn't interfere with the running parts of your machine, and it's not on the outside where it's going to look ugly, it's not really harming anything. And again, although this machine was uh, aluminum, which can oxidize, although it doesn't rust in the, in the, in the iron sense of the word, um, <clears throat> a lot of times leaving old oil and grease on places like, like here, for example. Here is that incredibly well-machined drive shaft that, that uh, is attached to the hand wheel. This is, you saw me just where I had greased the gears. Well, this here was old grease, right? It's sitting right there and I can tell it's, you know, it was there in the past. I, it looks like grease that just had been used on, and it kind of got or, or migrated over on this drive shaft. That does not interfere with anything. It doesn't slow anything down. It doesn't and, and actually, in some ways, it does coat and protect the steel. Now, you can clean that off with alcohol, and then you can go back, but you need to go back and put a clean, maybe just one drop, and I do mean one, take one drop of sewing oil, and then you can, of course, you can spread it around the steel to make sure that you've coated it. And you don't want to put that oil in the gear because that grease does not want to be diluted, not like in the way we did with the bearings. So there. And that's it. So now I am ready, or almost ready, to put the top back on the machine. Don't have to, but I can. Now, one of the things I want to do, there are two holes where <clears throat> the, uh, 
the bolts that hold on the, the bolts, where are the bolts? The bolts. The bolts that hold the lid onto the machine. Um, these bolts are, um, uh, they could use just one drop on each bolt on the threads. And again, that will make putting, it, putting them back in and removing them that much easier. While we're here, by the way, this almost gets forgotten sometimes. Look at, let's zoom back out. Look at the uh, underside of the lid of the machine and notice there are two little places here. And I'm going to show you what those are. Uh, there's a lid that was designed for the featherweight because remember it was, was and is a portable, one of the only portables from the vintage era. But of course that lid was designed to fold down if you didn't want to look at it. But of course that's how, notice it moves on these little hinges right here. And those are little spots where you want, you don't want oil, what you really want is a little grease. So I'm going to take my um, little, uh, uh, I can't say plunger, it's not a plunger, uh, a, uh, oops, squirted more than I wanted to, uh, syringe. And I'm going to, I'll take, take a little bit of the extra I had over there and I'll just put that under here. Again, you might say, oh, well, what's, you know, why do you have to do that? Because parts that were designed to be lubricated, uh, you know, if you expect them to perform, then you need to, to treat them the way, you know, they were meant to be. Now, of course, you hear it, you hear it uh, clicking down. Now it moves a little more freely. That, what that does is it takes stress off of these springs, right, so they can function properly without having to work extra hard. Again, it's just it's following the following the, uh, the intention of the, the original engineers who created these amazing, I call them marbles, but maybe I'm just comparing it to the new plastic crap that we often get, get to choose from when we're in a uh, uh, store buying consumer items. Okay, now I'm gonna take my, my bolts, put them in the top, because I have essentially finished what I needed to do here as far as cleaning and lubrication in the top section of the machine. And again, approaching restoration this way is, is, is good because A, it gives you an idea of, you, you have some mental concept of where am I in this process? Because if you, if you just kind of take it on willy-nilly and you don't really think about it logically, you know, you can think, gosh, uh, how long is this going to take? How long it takes is going to depend on Number one, what kind of place was this machine stored in? Has it been used recently? Most of them have not. Uh, where it was stored, is any, it just depends, right? It's going to vary. But now we've lubricated that section. Let's move on to, I guess we'll move on to the side compartment. Okay, I've got the machine repositioned here. Um, what you're looking at, of course, is the side, I call it the the left side compartment, or what is really the needle and presser bar area of your machine. And it, most every machine either has, uh, it's either a flip door that works off a little hinge and a little spring, or they have, uh, they have uh, set screws or screws you have to un undo to get, to get inside there. So you guys saw me earlier, I put a drop or two of oil on the threads of what is the presser bar adjusting screw. Now I'm going to go inside. Now what are we looking at? Sometimes you're going to want to use your hand wheel. Now your manual will have oiling points designated for you because I've uh, used these, uh, uh, because I've overhauled this model so many times I, I already know where they are, but if you ever wonder you can always of course uh, double check your manual. Let's zoom in a bit. I'm going to move, zoom in here so you guys can get an even closer view, hopefully, of what I'm up to. So, on the inner end of this, there is, uh, of course, the drive shaft spins and there's a big cam in here. So, I'm going to put a drop or two in the back. Now, notice I've got lots of moving parts. Some of these have little holes for oil. But again, because it hasn't been oiled in a while, I'm going to put more than one. I'll probably put two or three drops. And I may get some oil dripping. 
Okay, the sewing machine oil itself will not hurt the motor. Um, and notice this is, this is why we want to get all the dust and lint out before we did this. And what you're going to do is if you can't always tell what you're looking at and seeing, I know the, the, the manual will have, um, you know, it's going to have a, uh, a, di a diagram, sort of. And what I'm doing is anytime I see moving metal parts against each other, I'm putting a drop or two. Now, you may not need three drops because your machine, this machine was not frozen at all. In fact, it, it's, uh, it's been treated pretty well over its life. But again, now I'm oiling, here's the uh, needle bar. And notice I want to oil it here before it takes its downstroke. And now, now we've got oil that has covered the whole shaft. And then on the, on the bottom end, we'll do the same thing. And then as it comes up, Again, that's how you're covering the needle shaft with all that oil that it has been waiting for. And again, I, I want to emphasize, oh, look at that. Remember we were talking about thread. There's a little piece there. Okay. Um, the needle, the presser bar also needs lubrication. Okay. And it's going to, oops, that was the outside of the presser bar. So I'll put some here, pull the presser bar up, make sure there it's getting a, uh, getting some lubrication. Now I could, there's a little place at the very top where there's like a little, there's a little line where any kind of dust and, and oil would have stopped. It's kind of like a, you can tell where the, um, you can see that little line there where the, uh, that's as far down as the shaft goes. And you can take oil, uh, alcohol if you want, and you can take that off if you want. But the main thing is always have a fresh film of oil there. And again, to, to, to really, I do want to overemphasize this on purpose, which is when you are simply uh, restoring a sewing machine, you really, um, excuse me, when you're just trying to oil your machine for a project, you never use this much oil because you're going to get oil on your fabric and your thread and your needle. This is a, uh, a procedure that I'm using to get this machine ready to, to sew again. So if we look in here, watch this. I'm going to point to this. I'm going to pull up on the presser bar, and you guys should be able to see this little, uh, it's like a little cam arm that moves that braces the bar. And that is a, a piece that I will put a little spot of grease on. I actually, the grease will stay there longer and that way I don't have to, and I can kind of work the grease in there a little bit. Again, just a little bit. You don't need a ton. Um, and then I'll show you on the back side in a moment. There's another spot for that grease. Okay, what have we got left here? We have lubricated the side. This is very important, obviously. This is where your needle bar is moving. You have moving metal parts. Now, um, let's take a look at... One thing about the door, <clears throat> just to show you, this particular door, it works. There's a little spring here, and I love this. Even the springs were attached with screws so that they could be replaced if they ever needed it. This one does not. And, of course, it's going to bump up against this um, outer shaft for the needle bar. And that kind of, you can see it when it bends, it clicks. And it's just, it's like a holding spring, for lack of a better word. And I'm going to put just a tiny little dab, once I know where it comes into contact, just a tiny little dab of grease there. Again, it, it's, it just, I didn't even really need that much of it uh, on there. So that's done. And I promised one little area in the back that will make sense, hopefully, when you see it. Now, you can see, once I position the camera properly, now, this is the area, this of course is the, the little lever that raises your uh, presser foot, presser bar and presser foot. And you can see some of the grease has already come down uh, out of there. Where I want the grease, I want it a little bit right here. Because there's a slot, and that slot, <clears throat> you can see it right there. And watch it move. You can see it moving between the two... Uh, the steel sides that are that are painted in black lacquer. So again, that just makes it easier. Your spring is actually what determines how heavily your your presser bar uh, pushes down on your fabric. 
Okay, so I may want to actually lighten that. It feels a little stiff. Um, <clears throat> okay, we are left with one area to lubricate, and we will have lubricated the whole machine. And again, for those of you who are just checking in on the video, or sometimes I do repeat things on purpose in this case, is you definitely always want to know that this is not how much lubrication that you would use if you were simply getting ready for a sewing project. No matter what your machine is, you have a vintage machine, it's running great, you're like, oh, I need to oil it because I'm starting a project. Yes, you do. And you put, uh, again, your manual will show you all the specific areas for the machine. I'm going to do the grease first. I typically do that. And then I will follow up with machine oil and we will be done with this part of the sewing uh, of this 301's restoration. Now, there's another set of gears right here. And they're very similar to those that were in the upper part of the machine. Now, what am I going to do? I'm going to do the same thing I did before. I'm going to take uh, a dab of this. In this case, it's metal on metal gear, so I'm using this synthetic grease. But again, if you have, by the way, if you have Singer lubricant, it's perfectly fine. That's what was originally used, and I'll be going back to that. I'm not going to necessarily keep using the synthetic grease. I think it's not necessary to do so. Now, you can do one of two things. You can focus on this gear in the back. You can focus on this gear right here. But notice I'm just going to dab. And what I'm trying to do is get as far around the gear as possible. But that's it. I mean, I'm just dabbing grease uh, and not a lot of it. Uh, more is not better when it comes to lubrication. Uh, the only exception to that being instead of one drop of sewing oil, you're seeing me use more because this machine has not been used in a while and it's a little dry. So I'm going to come over here and trying to use really just as little as I need to. And there you go. I've covered, I've gone all around this gear that's facing us. Now watch as I turn the hand wheel, it's, it's spreading that grease on the other gear. So you don't have to grease both of them. That's kind of a bit of redundant. I was just trying to move. And you can see, even with as little grease as I have used, notice the grease kind of showing up here on the edge. Those gears are pushing out the grease that they don't need. So really, that's already more grease than we, we really need. In fact, I'm going to take, I'm going to get a clean uh, cotton swab. And I'm actually going to come over here and just get that excess grease there because it can go flying, it, you know, it'll end up who knows where. Uh, most of the time it doesn't hurt anything, but it's just not, it doesn't need to be there. Again, we, we get convinced that we need something that we, you know, we need grease. So we think we should put more and again, more is not better, even in the res restoration uh, uh, approach to this. <coughs> now, that's, that's it. That's the greasing we need to do under the machine. Now, let me pan back out a bit. Again, your sewing machine manual will show you the points that need to be oiled. I don't need to see the manual because I'm, I'm really familiar with 301s, and you would be too if you worked on enough of these. Now, remember, I've already gotten the dust out of here. The dust came all the way, uh, was removed from the machine from the top down. This was the last place. There's no dust. Dust and grease and oil are not a good combo. If you mix them, you have what is essentially a big mess. <laughs> you don't really hurt the machine, but you create this greasy mud you don't need. All right. So, again, you don't have to memorize this. The manual will show you. But look here. I, I know that this is a point. There's a little hole there. Sometimes you won't see them. But notice where there are these drive shafts underneath the machine that the mechanics of the machine pivot on. Okay, so notice that there's a shaft here and you see this piece pivoting. So I know I want oil here, right? Uh, you can start from the top down just to make it easier to remember what you've done. Uh, notice I'm going to put some there because there's a drive shaft there that that gear's turning on. What about over here, right? I, when I see metal turning against metal and, you know, I know that it needs to be lubricated. Um, and so... Let that be your guide. And that's what I typically do. I start at the top and look for any, any of these moving parts that I need to address. And then I just work my way down. And it helps me remember what I've done so I don't forget. See, I've done that. 
If I'll come over here, I've got some, some, some places here I want to take care of. And then don't forget, as you work your way down, you will see, you'll see, you'll see there's, there's a little separate one in the back and then one here in the front. Now, this machine is not as dry as some, okay? It, it, it had been used before. So I'm not as worried about it. So I'm using what you're seeing me use. I know it's hard to see the drops of oil as I'm doing this. Basically, I'm putting two, maybe two and a half, three drops. Two drops for this one. You may need three. That's not the normal oil amount you need for normal use. That is for restoration of a machine. You sometimes need a little extra oil, okay? Oh, that's not a drip. I had a drip on my motor there. Now, we are working our way around to the bobbin area, but I am going to show you a little area back here on the 301. And if you look right here, and I turn the hand wheel, you'll see another spot. Okay, so the hand, so this drive shaft is moving, right? And don't see any, uh, if I'm seeing a metal part that it's having to move against, uh, but so far I don't. You want to be very gingerly, ginger, gingerly. You want to be conservative when it comes to oil near the bobbin area. And that's what we're going to do next. And I'll explain why. Well, actually, it's probably obvious why you don't want a lot of oil down here, because this is a place that lint naturally gathers. All machines, if they're going to have lint, this is typically where they're going to have them. Let's get the camera lowered and I'll show you what I mean. Okay, folks, this of course is the, the shuttle area. This is where the bobbin case will be getting reinstalled. Now, what am I gonna do? I don't want alcohol on my lacquer, so I'm gonna take a little, not a lot, I'm just gonna take a little sewing oil on my, um, on my uh, cotton swab here. And I know that oil attracts dust. And so I'm being, notice I'm not, you know, just, I'm not pouring a bunch of oil in this space. I'm using as little as necessary. And then I'm going to go back and wipe that oil. Uh, it's also a nice way to clean this metal part of the machine. Um, nothing wrong with that because that's how we clean the rest of the paint on the machine. And again, I'm not putting the oil directly on the machine. Just put it on the end of the cotton swab here. And I'm just trying to make sure I can clean any of this some of it was, I don't want to say baked on dust, there's no baking in here, but just, you know, old dust that gets situated, and you can decide how much of this you want off of here. Again, this is all underneath, uh, doesn't really show, but you just never want loose dust. That's the big thing you're trying to avoid. Now, um, what am I going to do with this area? Okay, I'm just going to come behind myself. I've got a little uh, soft Kleenex, a little softer than the, and I'm just going to going in here to basically wipe off any of that residual oil. It's done its job. It's cleaned this area. Now, in order to clean the area of your shuttle, notice that this on this particular machine and also on the featherweight, it can uh, move. Remember, we inspected this in a prior video. I, I showed you how to inspect for, again, you see old dirt and oil coming out of here. I showed you how to inspect your um, uh, your uh, shuttle for threads. Remember, you can have loose threads in there. We, we took care of that. Now, what you're going to do here, I want you to look closely. Right here, you want to make sure that there's no dirt or lint in this area. Right where, if you look here, this, this little area, this big disc that the shuttle sits in is called the race. Okay, Think of it as like a racetrack. And it spins inside that rim. Now, here's the thing. It needs a very small amount of sewing oil. When I say small, I mean small. Because you want as little oil as necessary that will do the job without... You don't want to put any more than you need to because oil is a magnet. And the last thing you want is a magnet for lint because <laughs> lint already comes here. So you don't want to encourage that. So I'm going to show you a little tool I have. And I'm also going to show you, if you don't have the tool, you don't need to go out and get it. There's another way to do this. This is called, what was this called? 
it says brother on it, but it's just a, it's an oiling pen, okay? It, it holds sewing machine oil, and it has a very tiny and a very sharp, you need to be careful with these, uh, end to it. Now, it was designed to allow you to apply sewing machine oil in small amounts. So, there's an issue, though. Uh, they don't control oil very well. I'm trying to show you guys this. You can see the oil is dripping out of it about as fast as my oiler. Uh, it worked a little better when I got it. Now it's, eh, it's, it's okay, but I'm worried I'm going to get too much oil in there. So what do you do? How, are you, how do you get a tiny amount of oil in there? Well, there's something that all of you as sewers should have, and it's a sewing pin. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, I've got to zoom back out here <clears throat> so you can see what I'm doing. I've got this pin, and I'm going to put one drop of sewing machine oil on my pin there. And what's going to happen is that drop is going to hang on that pin, okay? Whoops. Now, what I want to do is get just enough. In fact, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a drop back on the the, the the painted surface right down here. And now what I have, I don't even know if this will show up on camera for you all, I have a very small droplet amount of oil on the head, on the very tip of this sewing pin. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it and I want to hold it right here. And by the way, this is not just for the 301. Virtually every vintage sewing machine will have um, there, that's the amount I wanted right there. I gotta do this without my, my knuckles being in the way. So I'm looking now. Now look at the end of the pin there. There's, I don't think it's going to show up, but there is a small amount of sewing oil, and that's exactly what I want. I want it right here, at the edge of the rim here, where this piece moves. I may go. I may. I may go there a couple of times. There we go. And that's a tiny amount of sewing oil, and that's all you need. And this area does not get oiled as often, but your manual should probably direct you to do so. But again, I want to encourage you to be very, very conservative with that oil in that spot. Okay, that piece uh, moves, and again, metal moves against metal. It needs lubrication. But that is essentially that. Now, while we're on that topic, I want to not, last but not least, I want to include this amazing device in my hand. This is an original Samanco made by Singer bobbing case that fits either the Singer 301 or the Singer Featherweight. Because remember, they use the same bobbin and shuttle system. Now, I want to take the bobbin out of the bobbin case and notice, of course, it's still attached to thread. And as I mentioned before, what I want to do is I'm going to cut this thread. So I've cut the thread, taken my bobbin out. Now, remember that you always want to remove any thread from a bobbin case the same direction it came in. Okay? So if we're on the outside of the bobbin case, where are you, outside? Here it is, right side up. I want to pull the thread in the same direction that it was originally put in. You don't want to pull threads out backwards because it stresses the springs. Now if you look on the inside of the bobbing case, you will see what I see is some very old oil, micro dust. I mean, it was running just fine, but again, this is a restoration, so I'm going to take just a little dab of uh, my 91% rubbing alcohol on my uh, cotton swab, and I'm going to very carefully and gently, don't be rough, I'm going to go around the inside, and you can see I'm pulling up some, some old, old oil, dirt. Again, they were engineered beautifully, but we want, to, uh, we want to really give the machine a chance to shine. Look at that, right? Um, many of you have machines that have some of this uh, in the bobbing cases. Sometimes I get bobbing cases, and I don't see anything. But who knows? Someone may have squirted oil in there one day thinking they were, you know, and then I will show you why oil can be helpful. I don't know that bobbing cases get oil that often as part of your normal 
maintenance for those of those of you sewers who who use these machines and love them. Um, this one's a little dirtier than normal. Uh, let's see. take my tool that has the smooth end on it and come over here and see if there's anything that needs a little help coming off there. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but bobbing cases, uh, you may not be able to see it very easily, but bobbing cases have springs. They're actually very sophisticated little pieces of equipment. This is arguably one of the most amazing uh, bobbing cases ever created. And what we want to do is we're going to, again, take our pin, our sewing pin, and I want to use a tiny amount of sewing oil. I'm going to put some on the edge of the pin here. And then I'm going to take and I'm going to put it right here. Put one, one, little, one drop there and then on the other end as well. And if you look, if you've seen my videos before, we've got a little cleaning to do here. Remember that See the piece of the bobbing case, see how it slides? Well, that, that's metal sliding on metal, and it, it has a good chance that it's a little dirty. Again, it's sliding. It's, again, these, I don't want to suggest to you that the parts on these machines are somehow delicate. They're obviously, in some ways, they're very tough, and they've lasted a long time. But I want this bobbing case to uh, continue to be heirloom quality and function in its intended use because if you have to uh, replace a Singer bobbing case you are looking at here's here's my little drop of oil on the pin and I'm gonna put it right there again I'm looking for a tiny tiny amount of oil because that's all that the case needs the case doesn't need a lot of oil and if you put too much you're gonna end up with uh, here's another little droplet you're going to end up with a, a globby mess that you really don't want. Now, when I <coughs> go to pull the lever on this, it still bounces, but now it doesn't have to work as hard, right? You're giving the machine a... Now it can do its thing the way it was intended to and not have to, to, to do it in spite of um, the... The old dirt, the old oil that have been built up over the years, and I would encourage any of you who have Singer Featherweight or 301 bobbing cases to remember that these devices were in the, the quality of their construction and engineering. It's it's even hard to imagine. You can get um, there's a company in Japan that makes uh, reproductions of them. And they're not bad. I've, I've never used one. I've heard that their quality is okay, but people still prefer the originals. And uh, they're about $60 on eBay. So um, it's uh, the closest thing to a Swiss watch I think I've ever seen in a bobbing case. I know that sounds nerdy, but uh, what can I say? It's true. And uh, I've got a little bit of thread here left, so I'm going to get a bobbin with some more thread before I install it. But anyway, as I uh, begin to uh, address the rest of the machine, we've got to take care of that drip pan. That's a separate video. But I just wanted to show you, again, now you've seen the 301 go through both uh, lubrication, excuse me, cleaning and lubrication. <clears throat> and then as we move forward, we'll, of course, save the, the buffing of the paint for, the, for last. We save the, the good part for last as we get it, uh, as we get it ready. So we've got the drip pan to take care of, and then I will be uh, reinstalling, of course, the, uh, the needle plate. And I'll actually include that in the video because some of you may have found, as you remember, this little ear needs to be in a certain spot. That's unique to featherweights and 301s. It's not hard. There's nothing negative about it, but you need to be aware of it because if you're not, you won't be able to get your uh, bobbin case in and you'll be confused, um, as anyone would be the first time you try it. So. Anyway, guys, hope that was helpful. I've been, again, focusing on yet another of my sewing machine uh, restoration candidates here to kind of show you the process. You don't have to do things in this exact order. Some of you may already have your own methods and, and you're happy with them. The main thing I'm, I'm showing this for you is, for many of you, you may be new to sewing machine restoration, 
maybe you just have a machine of your own that you want to work on yourself. And I'm just showing these, I'm doing this video primarily to help those of you who may uh, need some tips or some shortcuts on how to do it. And, and like I say, when you do this in sections, you say, okay, I've done this part, I've done this area of the machine, and that way you can kind of, um, you, you know, you can feel good about the fact that you're, you're on target. It's not like you're lost in some massive project and you don't know where you are. So, um, I will uh, end this video on that note with the lubrication in place. And uh, basically all we have left, as I said, is to reassemble some parts. Uh, we'll be putting in a new needle, of course, getting the sewing foot back on, getting in, getting some thread. I'll probably put in some, I, I like, I love sewing with uh, featherweights and 301s with silk thread in a size 14 or 12 needle. They really shine and prove themselves to be uh, deserving of their status as one of the Singer Company's very iconic machines from the golden era when Singer was, uh, was essentially the most powerful sewing machine manufacturer on the planet once upon a time. Anyway, folks, if you have questions or comments, leave them in the comments section below. If you have not subscribed to my channel, uh, please feel free to do so. If you subscribe, then you can look under the About tab. You Actually, I learned you have to subscribe in order to see, and there's a way to contact me by email. Uh, but other than that, I appreciate you watching, and stay tuned for the next installment.